and welcome to Honey Party of Five and a Half. Welcome! Rebecca? Yes? When I say the word museum, what goes through your mind? Wasp. Wasp? Yes. What does that mean? Because one time you surprised me and took me to the Wasp Museum, which I thought was about little tiny wasps with little <laughs> tiny wings, but it's not about that. It's it, like the women in aviation. Isn't it out in West Texas somewhere in it's the middle in, of nowhere? It's in Sweetwater next yeah. to Abilene. Yeah. And I thought it was so cool. It was like a surprise. We drove all day. We stopped at a fun place to eat in Abilene. I don't remember the name of that place, but it was cute. And then... It was a little cafe. Yes. Yeah. We drove up to the Wasp Museum, which I thought was going to be about flying critters. So what was it about? Other flying critters, actually. <laughs> Women in aviation, which I thought was so cool. And it, I mean, there was like tons of things there that were, I remember it was not air conditioned. <laughs> so there's yeah, it was that. more of a warehouse thing. They were building a whole new warehouse. They were. New stuff. Maybe yeah. So yeah. it was for World War II, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It was really cool. It was like the the role that the women played and how they were great pilots also. Um, they just didn't get quite the recognition for it. But they even like would fly and pull the tar- target practice flags for oh, like. Yeah. They, you know, they, had had the, some... they had the target practice flags where they were shooting from yes. the ground at them. Right. It was just like, uh, what do you call it? Paintballs? But it wasn't. Yeah. It's still, so... that's. That's kind of crazy. crazy. Yeah. I know. And they were supposed to be just like phenomenal pilots. I'm sure they were. Okay. You have the Wasp Museum. Uh-huh. The museum I think of first is the Action Figure Museum. Okay. Where is that? <laughs> it's in Paul's Valley, Oklahoma. We got to get out more. Okay. And what's funny is about this is for 30 years, we have family that live in Oklahoma City. So for 30 years, we've been driving back and forth. Yes. And I have seen that billboard. For 30 years. Yeah. And every time we drive by it, I'm like, Rebecca, should we go this time? Do we have time to go to the Action Figure Museum? And every time I say, no, not this time. Not this time. So there was one time when Drew was in at Oklahoma State going to college. I went up and visited him. Mm-hmm. So I was all by myself. Perfect so, time. yep. As I was driving back home, I'm like, I'm doing this now. Rebecca can't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad you did that without me. <laughs> And what's funny, the kids are older now, and I don't think they would get much out of it. But if our kids were like 8, 10, and 12, they would love this museum. Really? It's like you go in, and it's nothing but, obviously, action figures. And yeah. It's got different rooms with Batman, Superman, and all these different things. So I thought it was really cool. Mm-hmm. I drove down into downtown Paul's Valley. Right, right which yeah. is where I would have gone to find a local coffee shop. Yeah, there's a cute coffee <laughs> shop there, too. But I was, I was laser-focused. And it was funny when I... <laughs> When I went in to buy the ticket, they seemed surprised that I was there and they were buying a ticket. Because who goes there? Because I didn't have, well, and I didn't have any kids with me. Oh, the only people that were there were parents with kids. So they were like, okay, yeah. But I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed it. So that would be one that we didn't both experience, but that was one of my favorites. Right. So do you have another favorite museum? Another favorite one that I actually would like to revisit now that I feel like I have uh ramped up my study of the old testament is the mm. bible museum in um dc, DC. Yeah. yeah really cool museum and i think i would even now just i mean i think we went like what four years ago something like that i think even now i would have even a greater appreciation for it just i feel like my biblical history knowledge is like exploded in the past couple of years so I, I would like to go back. That's a super cool one. Yeah. And for me, this isn't really a museum. My mm-hmm. other choice is the Sagrada Familia. Yeah. Which is a cathedral in Barcelona. Right. I guess we're kind of country dropping now that we've yeah. been in Spain. We've been to Spain a couple of times. A couple of times. You know how that goes. It's really uh, the only international company I've ever, country I've ever been to. Yeah. You've gone with me on a couple of work trips right. to Barcelona. Right. And the Sagrada Familia is just this... Some would say it's a monstrosity yeah. because Gaudi built it and it's it has weird, extreme, impressionist statues and it's just things you wouldn't think of in a cathedral. That's right. And it's been, they've been working on it for like over a hundred years now and mm-hmm. it's not technically done yet. Yeah. So I just like that it's so different. Yeah. So that's why I like Absolutely. that Absolutely. Yep. Well, then you're going to love this guest we have on today. His I think name, I am. Yes, you will. You're going to nerd out. His name is Russ <laughs> Ramsey. He's an author, he's a pastor, and he is an art connoisseur, and he's got his a little Rolodex of art that he loves, as do you and as do I, which is one thing I learned today, and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> it can be different. It, it can be, be different. It can yep. be different. So we hope you enjoy this interview with Russ Ramsey.
Well, thank you again for taking time to talk to Hardy Five Five and a Half. I know that you probably have a busy schedule, so we appreciate you taking a few minutes. Yeah, thank you for your persistence in, in, in reaching <laughs> out. I, I really do appreciate it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Excited <laughs> to talk to you. So how did you become, how like did art become so important to you? It, it started when I was really uh, in middle school uh, and high school. I found one that that a lot of the friends that I, I kind of was drawn to tended to be kids who drew uh, and, and liked to draw things. Mm-hmm. And then in, in art classes, especially in middle school and high school, I had art teachers that really, this is a small town, Indiana, you know, a farming community. But our art teachers were really uh, interested in helping us develop a lifelong relationship with the arts. And so they would uh, do more than just give us projects to do, but they would teach us about artists and techniques and um, basically tell us stories. And then in high school, my, my art teacher in high school gave us this advice, which has proven, you know, here, you know, 35 years later, proven to be true. And that is, she said, if you want a lifelong appreciation with art, just find an artist that you connect with and then pay attention to them for the rest of your life. And they will you know, they'll introduce you to their colleagues when you go visit them at a museum and, and you'll read little plaques on the wall and, and they'll introduce you that way to their mentors. Mm-hmm. And uh, so from Van Gogh, I found my way to Rembrandt, another Dutch painter. And, um, and you know, all these years later now, I've just kind of accumulated this, this knowledge base, but also uh, just uh, familiarity mm-hmm. with a lot of uh, works of art and um, they've kind of become part of the permanent collection that I carry around inside of me, you know, wherever yeah. I go. So, so that's kind of how that, how that happened. I, I, I was never a, um, I wasn't an art major in college and, uh, all of my, my research in art has just been kind of on my own through reading and, and, uh, researching online and in, in libraries and stuff like that, used bookstores. And, yeah. um, but it's, it, I found that it really, uh, uh, it's very helpful for me uh, as a person and as a pastor and as a writer to be putting uh, myself in the path of beautiful things on a regular basis. Mm. Uh, it's been very important to, yeah. to the formation of, of who I am and how I move through the world, you know? Yeah. Well, and I was one of those, I was one of the drawers. I was the doodler yeah, and the friends. artist and <laughs> yeah, you had probably hung out with me because I was the one doing the drawing. <laughs> And as a kid, I got enamored with Rembrandt. That's where I started. And I would, I redid like for art class, I would redo his paintings and all that, or try to, you know. So (laughs) yeah, that's where Rembrandt is really where I got started Mm -hmm. in art. So, and comic books and all that, but like the high art was Rembrandt for me. So yeah. yeah. So you just particular, was there a particular painting or, or two that for Rembrandt that really kind of were flagships for you? The one that really hit me, oh gosh, I think just his self-portraits, the lighting and his self-portraits, oh my, yeah, just how he draws you in and you feel like you're sitting right, right in front of him. I think that's really, mm-hmm. yeah, that's really what got me. So yeah. just his yeah. use of lighting. Yeah. You, you've yeah. done a lot of, I don't know what you call that. Like when you draw, like not just him, but you did all the presidents. You started drawing all, yeah, one faces, like, all the faces. Yeah. So uh, I think right. you like the faces. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The portrait stuff is really cool to me. Just the different mm-hmm. things you can do with a face. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, I remember doing that one summer. Yeah, that's right. Like sixth grade, I drew all the presidents. I, don't know. <laughs> I can draw Garfield. That's it. That's all I can do. <laughs> and I practiced it over and over to be able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of Rembrandt, you wrote a book called Rembrandt is in the Wind. And I just love this book. And there's a moment when you you start out the book talking about three transcendentals. So tell us about mm-hmm. the transcendentals and how they affect our lives. So the three transcendentals, this is a term that philosophers use for the, the, the triad of truth, beauty, and goodness. Mm-hmm. And what's distinct about truth, beauty, and goodness is that these are three pursuits that are common only to human beings. Um, so we're the only creatures on the planet that that are that pursue a deeper knowledge of truth uh who pursue a a moral sense of goodness and uh, have a moral sense of goodness and evil um and people who engage with beauty for beauty's sake uh 
Uh, and that that's part of what makes, that's part of what differentiates humans from the rest of creation and part of also what reflects back uh, that statement in Genesis 1 that, that we're created in the image of God, that, that part of being made in the image of God is that there are um, there are pursuits and uh, uh, um, values that human beings uh, take on that are unique only to people. Uh, and that is the, the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness. And so, um, so art is, is one of those things that involves all three, uh, but really kind of is, is more maybe dominant on the, uh, the pursuit of beauty element of things, as opposed to something like, you know, books about philosophy or things like that, that might be focused more on the pursuit of, of truth or, or, uh, or goodness, you know, and so, um, yeah, so, so those are, those are three things that, that kind of taken together, uh, represent a lot of what it means to be a person. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned in the book that we tend to treat beauty different than goodness and truth, how do we treat beauty differently? Well, I, this is a Western thing in a lot of ways that, that as Western people, we can be very pragmatic. Uh, you know, let's get to the point, let's learn the, the lesson, let's apply the lesson, uh, and even when it comes to things like reading scripture, you know, we can read scripture as though, uh, you know, the point of reading scripture is to glean lessons from it. Mm -hmm. uh, when in fact, the majority of scripture is written as narrative, it's storytelling. And um, Flannery O'Connor once said that she said, a story is a way of saying something that can't be said in any other way. Mm -hmm. And I love that because because I think in the West, we can we can view stories as just kind of, I don't know, uh, trifles as things as entertainment as as uh, you know ways to distract ourselves or you know from from the business of learning. Uh, when in fact we're we are gatherers of stories. We're we're collectors of stories. When when the Lord was telling uh, the people of Israel in the wilderness how to raise their children, He said, "Tell them stories. Mm -hmm. uh, tell them where they come from. Tell them about." the the plagues tell them about the passover tell them uh about me and even jesus you know his primary method of teaching was parables there was a man who had two sons you know it, and and so uh in in the west we can we can look at all that and say well okay but what's the point what's the lesson um when the truth is that the sometimes the story is a trojan horse that slips a lot of things past our defenses um, because it's just, we want, we lean in, we want to hear stories, we want to know them. And, but they also have a complexity to them where there's often more than just one point or there's, or there's a nuance and a complexity or a, um, uh, it, it, sometimes even, even the, the absence of a clear point is the point, <laughs> you know, is mm, that yeah. this is, you know, you're just always going to have this kind of complexity in your life. And so art and and beauty is 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 a um, is a way of telling stories. Uh, when you look at a Rembrandt painting, you're looking not just at a still frame, but you're looking at a story. Mm -hmm. uh, and even even the way that Rembrandt and other great painters paint, they lead your eye through their canvas in a in a sequence. Like in a, your eye goes one place first, and then to another place, and then mm -hmm. to another place. And you're it's like you're turning pages in a book. Even though you don't really realize you're doing it, you're 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 looking in a sequence at a painting. And they're and they're telling a story, and they're using beauty to engage parts of your mind, parts of your brain, parts of your heart, uh, that would be different if somebody just tried to describe the painting to you. Uh, the way that color and light and darkness and facial expressions and eye contact and and uh, things that are uh, expected and things that are unexpected, all of these things kind of weave this narrative drama together mm -hmm. uh, so that when you engage with a work of art, part of the beauty is is kind of doing that Trojan horse thing of, of slipping past mm -hmm. the, the walls of your defense into, into the heart of who you are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Well, and taking that chance, like you talked about in the West, we're so, I think we're obsessed with being productive. So I need to, like you're saying, I've got to read this and I've got to apply exactly what I need right now. And then I can just move on yeah. instead of taking that breath. And just like you said, maybe there's no point to this story. Maybe it's just for me to relax and take this in. And it's just that's part of the function. Yeah. yeah, that's part of the function of art is to slow us down. Yeah. You know, is to, is to uh, 
is to consume a lot of our bandwidth. Uh, you know, like I, 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 I talk about when, when, when I go to an art museum, um, I usually experience what I, what I call museum feet, uh, which is that feeling when you're in a museum where it feels like your feet are set in cinder blocks before too long. And it's just hard. To, you're like, why is it so hard for me to just even walk around? Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, be, it's because we're, we're image bearers of God who are meant to be in the presence of glory, mm -hmm. but also in our, in our fallenness that being in the presence of glory uh, consumes a part of us. It taxes us, it drains us. And so when we go into museums where you have these works of art that have, you know, stood the test of time for hundreds of years and have demonstrated their worthiness of being on the walls of these places where people give up vacation days and travel halfway around the world just to be in their presence. Yeah. Uh, they they take something from us when we're in their presence. They 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 draw from us a that hunger for glory that is in us that's in all the Psalms, you know, David talked about wanting to be, wanting to experience the glory of the Lord, um, that when we, when we're in the presence of beautiful things, whether it's an art museum or the Grand Canyon or whatever, and we just, <clears throat> we feel ourselves almost like a video game character where our energy is just depleting, depleting, depleting. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's part of how God made us to be uh, in, in the presence of glory. And, and beauty does, has this beautiful way of of exhausting us in the most redemptive uh, and helpful way of, of giving us rest and contentment and, and at the same time. Hmm. Hmm. I've never thought about that, but you're right. I mean, I can go spend time at a museum and walk out feeling tired and I've never thought about yeah. that before. So do you like have to gear yourself yeah. up? Do you have like six cup of coffee? Like, what do you, what do you do to gear yourself up to go into a museum? Do you, you know what I do is, I mean, I gear myself up with coffee just to enter any day of the week. You know? um, <laughs> that's normal. But, but uh, yeah, that's that's normal. Um, <laughs> usually, when I go to a museum, I go looking for my friends, uh, meaning Van Gogh and Rembrandt, and I have a few others. Um, and I will I will give my first attention to them. I'll walk past a whole lot of stuff when I go into a museum um, to find my people. And then when I find them, I let them introduce me around. And if anything on my way catches my eye that I want to circle back to, mm -hmm. um, yeah, part of my strategy for entering a museum is, is to know I'm not going to take in this whole museum in one visit. Okay. Uh, and if I have to leave a lot of stuff unseen or unengaged with, that's just the cost of, of doing business, right? That's, yeah. that's, um, and so I'll, I'll kind of give, give the energy that I've got to the places I want to give it most, um, and let myself be surprised along the way uh, by, by other things. I think that's another part of the Western mindset is, is we feel like, you know, we need to do the museum in a day. Uh, yeah. You know, you need to go to, you, you're, you'll spend the morning at the Louvre, uh, and then you'll go across the street and spend the afternoon at the um, uh, Musée d'Orsay, you know, and, and yeah. like, what are we talking about? <laughs> this is, right. you can't take in that much in one day. <laughs> and, and also Paris. Um, you know, you, you just can't, we can't. You just can't. Yeah. But I do think you're right. I mean, we tend to go, we've, we've spent this money. We've got to see everything. We've got, we've got three hours to get through this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So we watched a Netflix um, show and I can't remember the name of it, but it was on the Isabel and Jack Gardner heist. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You, yeah. I saw that too. Yeah. I can't remember the name of it. Can you tell us a little bit about that heist and then tell us what about them? Yeah, so so um, so the documentary is about an art heist at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston uh, on uh, in March of 1990, St. Patrick's Day, the night after the wee small hours of the morning after St. Patrick's Day, um, two thieves dressed as Boston police officers um, got buzzed into that museum by the security guards. They were then uh, the security guards were then handcuffed, and then these two. Um, people dressed as police officers spent the next 81 minutes taking 13 works of art out of the museum worth an estimated $500 million, oh, uh, which was the largest much. single property theft in American history at the time. I don't know if it's been beat yet. Cause that was like 33 years ago, but, mm -hmm. but it, I mean, it's incredible. And, um, uh, and none of that art has been recovered. Uh, there, there is a $10 million reward, I think, for for a tip leading to its return uh and uh it's just crickets um 
And so the museum itself uh, was put together by Isabella Stewart Gardner, who uh, she and her husband um, were wealthy and they would they would collect art from around the wor world, folk art and fine art. Uh, and then she lost her husband. Uh, and as a part of her grief, she built this museum kind of in his honor. But also she said that she was trying to build something that wouldn't die. Uh, and part of part of doing that is she put this permanent collection together. And in the uh, the bylaws of the museum, she stipulated that nothing can ever be added or taken away from this museum. And if anybody ever tried to do that in the trust, uh, that the whole collection would have to be liquidated and uh, given to Harvard. Wow. Um, and so when the theft happened, um, the Rembrandt Storm on the Sea of Galilee painting, uh, which is the only seascape that Rembrandt ever painted, um, it was cut out of its frame with a knife uh, and presumably rolled up and, and taken out into the night. And um, <clears throat> And because of the that stipulation and the trust for the museum, the frame for that painting is still hanging on the wall. And so if you go to that museum, you can go stand in front of the empty frame that used to hold the Storm on the Sea of Galilee painting. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, and so it's a, it's a fascinating, the museum is a fascinating thing in and of itself because she regarded it as its own um, its own work of art, uh, that the museum as a whole was that. Oh, yeah. For sure. and so yeah, so that, that story really drew me in. I, I was fascinated by the painting, by the heist, uh, by the absence of it, any of its return. You know, it's it's such yeah. a it, it it's it doesn't bode well uh, for right. the future of that art. That that ten million dollars is on the table and nobody has been able to produce a, a useful tip. Or nobody's yes. trying to sell it or yeah, anything. Yeah, that's one thing yeah. we talk about. We're like, why would you sell this? You know, you can't ever get rid of it. You right, can't yeah. ever let anybody know that you have this. So right, right, yeah, that. yeah. In in that chapter in the book, I I go into a little bit about what happens with stolen art because because in our in our minds, if we don't know anything about it, you think you steal you know a fifty million dollar painting and you try to sell it for fifty million dollars, but that's not really what anybody does. It's it turns out it's it's more valuable as a currency because the international laws regarding stolen art are way less severe than um, than bank fraud. Uh, or, or or something like that, and and also you you can't uh, the penalties are very low if you can demonstrate even if you're in the possession of stolen art if you can demonstrate that you didn't steal it uh, or you can even make a case that you didn't know it was stolen mm -hmm. um, you know and so what will happen is somebody will steal art and then they will use it as a kind of a black market currency where they'll trade it to you know, say an arms dealer for guns, and then the arms dealer will trade it to a drug dealer for drugs. And, and by the two or three people down the line, it's the painting has in effect been laundered and yeah. it's not in the hands of the people who stole it. And so now uh, they can sell it on the black market and whoever buys it um, is not at a great risk of, of being penalized in any way um, no. because even if it gets found, they may lose it. Uh, it may have to get returned. But they can say, I didn't know it was stolen or or um, I didn't steal it. Here's where I was when when that happened. And so, you know, so those kinds of things uh, end up being what happens with a lot of usually it's it's um, organized crime. Uh, there's one quote that I, I read from a. A, uh, a security detail, a, a, a security director at a museum who said a lot of art theft is is not it's not the Thomas Crown affair. It's more like a Coen Brothers movie. Um, that, <laughs> that usually the people doing the thieving uh, don't have a clear sense of really what it is that they're taking. Yeah. A lot of times. Now, sometimes that's not the case, but 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 a lot of times, you know, um, okay. they're just trying to get away with something or do what they're told. Yeah. Wow. Um, so in that, you mentioned the Rembrandt painting, uh, Storm of Galilee, and that's kind of where the centerpiece mm -hmm. of your book comes. So why did you decide to make that the centerpiece of your book? Well, one, because I love Rembrandt. Uh, yeah. Two, because I feel like Rembrandt's familiar. He's a familiar enough painter uh, that, you know, whatever I named the book after, I wanted it to have as broad a, an appeal as possible. Um, and so, you know. But also, uh, I, I I like the the i the, that painting in particular, the storm on the Sea of Galilee, is such a fascinating painting. Not only because of the theft, uh, 
around it. The title for the book is kind of a play on words. It has a double meaning. The first meaning is, you know, when something is stolen and unrecovered, uh, law enforcement will describe that thing as being in the wind. Mm-hmm. And so the Rembrandt painting was in the wind. Um, but then in the painting, uh, Rembrandt painted himself into the boat. Uh, so he is in the storm on the Sea of Galilee, looking, and he's the one who's looking out at the viewer. And so in, in that sense, he's also in the wind, you know, he's, he's in the storm uh, in the boat. And so, um, so it's, it's a play on words, but, but, I, but I, uh, you know, a lot of what I talk about in that chapter uh, kind of threads through with the other stories that, that are told uh, there in the book as well. Um, why did Rembrandt paint himself in his picture so much? It, it's a way a lot of artists would do this and still do. It's a way of breaking the fourth wall. Uh, yeah. It's a way of uh, for the artist to draw the viewer into the scene that he's making. And so usually if you see a character in a painting who's directly looking at the viewer and it's not a portrait, you know, but it's just a some scene and one of the characters is looking at you, the odds are pretty good that it's the artist. Yeah. Uh, who's painting themselves in and they're and they're engaging with you and they're asking you to come in as well. So with Rembrandt, you know, he's he's putting himself in the boat, um, which if you remember that passage, what the disciples are asking Jesus is, don't you care that we're perishing here? Mm-hmm. Which is just, a, just drenched in irony, right? That they're asking the second person of the Trinity incarnate in the flesh who had come for the purpose of laying down his life for us to take the wage of sin upon himself so that we wouldn't die. They're asking him, don't you care that we're dying? Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, <laughs> there is. Yes. Uh, he does. Uh, but, but uh, you know, and so Rembrandt is asking us when he's looking at us, um, you're in the storm too. You mm-hmm. know, that's, that's what he's, te- he's telling us. Um, mm-hmm. Don't you care that we're perishing? And, yeah. um, and so that's, that's what artists usually are doing when they paint themselves in is they're inviting the viewer more intimately into the composition. Yeah. And what a beautiful story to invite someone into the gospel. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in the book, you go through different artists and you talk it, you kind of give a, you kind of give an overview of their lives and how it interacts with their art and all that. Um, the Another one that really hit me was Van Gogh. And I know that's one of mm. your favorites too. Um, he did, you said he did like 130 paintings a year. That's just, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. His, so he painted like 860 paintings over the course of his career, uh, uh, oil paintings. That doesn't count sketches, watercolors, letters. Uh, And he painted for nine years and the majority, only nine years. And the vast majority of those 860 paintings came in the last four years of his, of his life. So for the last three years of his life, he was averaging a painting every three days. Um, And then in the last three months of his life, in 1890, he was averaging one complete painting a day. Uh, and, and that was the pace he was working at. Yeah, it's it's crazy to think about. And these aren't like, you know, little thumbnail paintings. These are the ones yeah. in museums that you go and see. And they're, they're the Van Goghs that we think about. It's like a masterpiece um, a day. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and in the in the process of doing this, he only sold one. Um. He, he, uh, and that's what the chapter is about is, is kind yeah. of the, is, he struck me as the striving man in Ecclesiastes who, you know, is laboring and toiling under the sun and seeing no fruit from his labor and wondering what it's all worth. Uh, and yet he's doing something that's transcendent and eternal. And so, you know, he never saw the fruit yeah. of his work, um, but he's a household name. Yeah. around the world now and right. part of it is not and it's not because uh you know boy he just painted really cool paintings it's because his paintings are filled with ache and suffering and sorrow and hope and and uh you know and, and an eye for for you know loneliness and brokenness and love and all these things and then you have this body of letters that he's written that that are kind of is, is a is a, a a, a history of all of the paintings that he painted and he, and he wrote about a lot of them and he drew sketches of, of many of these. And so we know down to the month, sometimes even the, the day when he painted a lot of his paintings, there's a great website. That's um, I forget the name of it, but you can search Van Gogh painting archive and it'll, it has all of his paintings uh, and when they were painted and usually a reference to the letter 
uh, yeah. that it's mentioned in if it's mentioned there somewhere. So, um, yeah. yeah, he's he's fascinating because his art is connected to his story and it wasn't that long ago and we have so much information. Can you tell us the story of the painting that was that he did sell? Because I, I know a lot of people know that he didn't he wasn't very uh, he didn't he wasn't very successful while he was alive. But just talk about that one painting that he did sell. Yeah, it's called The Red Vineyard. Um, if you would like to go see it, all you need to do is go to Moscow. Uh, <laughs> okay. Russia, and uh, it's there in the Pushkin Museum. Uh, and it it's uh, it's. It, that might be hard to get to about right now. <laughs> well, I know. Yeah, you, you got to have some pluck. You got to have some <laughs> pluck if you want to go. Uh, if you want to go see it, um, you know, it, it, it's it's one of the things that drew me to it. Uh, it. It was one of my favorite paintings before I knew the story behind it. I'd flip through a Van Gogh book, and whenever I'd see that painting, my eye would just be drawn to it um, because it's different in that it's red. Uh, it's mostly red and yellow, and and what often what we think of Van Gogh is blue. Uh, his blues and yellows. Um, and, uh, it was of him seeing a harvest in the South of France called the vintage where, where they would harvest the grapes. And, and it was just, it was a, he, he wrote, he kind of wrote some notes about it in a letter to his brother. And then he went and painted it from memory. And, uh, it's, it's just a breathtaking, uh, image. Um, and it, and it's, it, it was from 1888. So it was, it was two years before he died. Uh, it was it was displayed at an exhibition in Brussels in 1890, um, the this the winter of 1890, uh, the early part of the year, and so he he knew of its sale, um, and uh, you know had had this delightfully modest uh, thing that he that he said to his mother. You know he said uh, you know basically um, I, I sold a painting. Uh, it didn't sell for much, but you know, it, it's, it's something and, and, uh, you know, it, it, it helps me, it'll help me continue on with my work, uh, which is such a crazy thing to say if for, you know, at that point, seven or eight, seven or eight years, you've been laboring at, at painting your brothers an art dealer, uh, who, who receives all of your work and still you, you haven't, you know, um, you haven't broken through. And a lot of that was just what, what art the art market in Paris, what it was, it wasn't ready for what he was doing. It didn't, it, his, his work was not popular. In fact, um, Starry Night, which is, you know, if people know anything about Van Gogh, they, they know two things. They know that he painted Starry Night and that he cut off his ear. Those are the two, that's the starter kit for knowing Vincent Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, um, he hated Starry Night. Uh, he felt like he, he knew that he was trying to paint something that would be commercially popular. Mm -hmm. And he, he, and in a, the way I describe it is, is he was an indie artist trying to write a pop song mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, he, and he knew it. And he was selling out. basically. Yeah. 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 And so, and, and so he wrote to his brother of it kind of in a very self-deprecating way of like, ah, I'm never going to do that again. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's interesting about that is we, um, we think of Van Gogh's style as Starry Night, you know, these swirling stars, and and really, there's not a lot of that. There's there's a lot of the it's all the heavy brushwork, but that swirling cloud star kind of thing is it's the only nightscape that he did like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some others that are daylight where the where you did clouds in a similar way, um, but that painting really kind of stands apart from everything else that he did. Um, as being really unusual, and yet it's the one that we most associate with with his style. Yeah. Um, so it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask a really non artsy person question, but you've got Van Gogh. Did he have any um, descendants? Any lineage? No, nothing. So, mm -hmm. no, so what happens when you have this kind of fame after you're dead? With any this, there's just no money from that going anywhere around his people. Like, well, yeah, there, there is his brother, uh, Theo, um, and his, and his, um, uh, and Theo's wife, uh, collected all, all of his letters, okay. uh, all of his, um, paintings. And so they had the collection after he died and right after he died, his, he, he became, he was in the process of becoming a very famous painter. Uh, he was, he was, uh, be, becoming, esteemed by other painters 
uh, in Europe while he was still alive. People were really taking note of him and starting to really take interest in what he was doing. Uh, but he never leave, lived to see that come to fruition. But uh, between 1890, when he died, and the turn of the century, um, his his work was shown in exhibitions all around Paris. He became one of the most celebrated painters in Europe um, by the turn of the century. Then in, in, in the 30s, um, Irving Stone got a hold of copies of the letters and, and wrote uh, his two kind of historical fiction books, Lust for Life and Dear Theo, which are both uh, Dear Theo is more of a narrative adaptation of the letters and Lust for Life is a is a, a historical novel based on the letters, but not in letter form. Um, and then just, to, you know, 20, 30 years after that, Kirk Douglas is playing him in a Technicolor uh, movie uh, based on Irving Stone's book. And he just, you know, he didn't see it. Uh, but his but his brother's family uh, became the 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 curators, I guess, of of Van Gogh's body of work. And now it's been you know it's been distributed around the world, and it's it's really not for sale yeah. uh, anymore. It's kind of most most all of it is now in in the company of of or in the custody of of museums, where it won't really be on the market. Probably, you know, mm-hmm. there's not a lot in private collections. Hmm. Yeah. That's a great question. I've never thought about it. who made all this money off of Van Gogh. You know I mean? Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned that he was striving, and he didn't really, he didn't see the greatness that he was going to be. And I think that's kind of how we are. We don't. I don't like you talked about in the book. I don't think he saw his value. He was searching to find some value in himself. Mm-hmm. So. How is that for, I mean, I think that's a universal thing. How do we discover value in ourselves? Yeah, I think, I think, um, you know, Van Gogh is actually is a really good case study for thinking about this because, because what a Christian would say is that value, the, the value of personhood is not something that we go out and obtain. It's something that we're born with. Um, as as image bearers of God, that because we're made in His image, we are in, we have inherent dignity, uh, we we have value and worth that is beyond measure, and we always will. And so we may we may s- suffer and struggle through life, contribute nothing uh, of of note, uh, and still we are of incalculable worth because we bear the image of God as people. Um, what what a lot of Western thinking, uh, a lot of Western thinking is, well, really to achieve greatness, I need to hit it big with something. Uh, yeah. I need to make a mark in some way. And so, you know, uh, I will I will write the great American novel or I will invent, you know, this device that will change people's lives or I will um, champion this cause and see something change. With Van Gogh, the reason that he's celebrated in the way that he is is not because of the Red Vineyard or Starry Night or Sunflowers or whatever. It's the body of work. It's the it's the body of work that that people celebrate, and and the reason that people celebrate the body of work from Van Gogh and not just this painting or that painting is because really the uh, the the art that he left behind is the story of who he was, uh, his struggle. Uh, to to find um, his struggle to live in a world that he found to be beautiful and that he wanted to contribute beauty to that didn't seem to want to recognize anything from him. He, mm-hmm. One of his things that he said is he, he said, I am, um, <clears throat> he said, a great fire burns within me and passersby only see a wisp of smoke. And that, boy, if that's not Ecclesiastes, I don't know what is, <laughs> right? That, that's, that's him. Um, saying, look, there's so much that's inside of me that I'm trying to give to the world. And he's giving it to the world through these canvases. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the, the uh, you know, it's, it's like what Jesus said about himself. He said, I, I came unto my own and my own did not receive me. Mm-hmm. Um, that there's a, there's a, Van Gogh's life so, certainly parallels that, that statement. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so, 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 you know, it, it we, one of the things that's just a testimony of Van Gogh's work is that to see irises or sunflowers or starry night or self-portrait with bandaged ear, you're looking at a portion of this body of work from this complicated transcendent artist 
whose life was filled with meaning and struggle and suffering and hope mm -hmm. and all of those things that are that are so common to the human experience and it's that that yeah. we celebrate rather than the you know the the pot of sunflowers right mm -hmm. yeah yeah because we all are complex and most people don't see everything that we have to offer inside just like just like him i mean that's very relatable mm -hmm. what you just said very relatable to me so I don't go to a lot of museums like he does, or I, I do. usually take you with me. Yes. Yeah. And he wants to stop and read everything. I get a little yeah. more nervous about going because I, I, here's why I get nervous. I think, I feel like I'm going to miss something important. I feel like I'm going to walk oh. through and I'm going to, and people are going to say, be standing at a picture and looking at it. And I'm going to say, I don't get it. And I am trying to find, what do you, what is it that you're getting? So how does a person like me enjoy Go about enjoy, you know enjoying a museum. What what's my game plan? <laughs> okay, um, first is make peace with the fact that you're going to miss stuff. You're going to miss big stuff. <laughs> yeah, you've already mentioned that when you said you're not going to see everything. I'm like, oh no, yeah. I've got the map. Like I usually am. Like we've got a plan. Yeah. So that is great <laughs> advice. <laughs> yeah, you're not. You don't have the bandwidth for that. Nobody does. <laughs> Thank um, you. And I feel released you know, for that. So. so, so abandon hope of seeing everything all ye who enter here you know i needed that i think you know <laughs> i think i think it's it's the understanding that that one um it's this way with movies books art poetry is that the stuff that if if you were to go around and ask 50 people, what is your favorite work of art? It can be a book, a movie, a painting, sculpture, poem, whatever. Um, everybody's going to have a different answer. And a lot of that is going to have to do with when they encountered that particular piece of art and why it connected with them. Mm -hmm. And so you may walk past a painting that uh, there's a crowd of people around and they're around it for a reason. And it may do nothing for you. And that is completely okay. Uh, because it's maybe it's just not time yeah. for you to connect with that piece of art. And maybe it'll never be time for you to connect with that piece of art. But then you'll go around a corner and you'll see something and it'll take your breath away or it'll bring tears to your eyes. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's intersecting with something that's going on inside of you then yeah. um, that, that, that transcends. Hmm. Um, and this is one of my, this is one of the things that I, I believe very strongly about humans and art. And I alluded to it earlier, but it's that we, we build our, we build and curate our own collections over time, uh, pieces of art that we've seen records we've listened to, um, that, you know, that, that when you think of that record, you think of it as one of yours, uh, and then there are other records that you know exist, but they're not one of yours, you know, and there are paintings that you know exist, but, you know, like, like uh, Munch's The Scream, mm. for example, is a painting that I I know about. I've known about it for years. It's not one of mine. Um, the Red Vineyard, though, is, you know, and Storm on the Sea of Galilee is. Mm. And uh, Salvador Dali, I've, I know them and I think they're interesting, but they're other people's paintings. And, and uh, you know, and so we do that. And so when we're going to a museum, Part of what I'm doing is I'm just kind of adding to my collection, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and so I, I will leave the museum with a few things um, that I've picked up that will now kind of reside in the gallery art, if you will. Um, and so, you know, I think I think also it's a, just a good exercise in being a person who um, exists in space and time. It's a good exercise to uh to have to wrestle with the experience of leaving things on the table hmm. of being able to say, I have limits, I have capacity. And it means that I may go to one of the most celebrated museums in the world and not see one of the most celebrated works of art in the world. Yeah. I'll come, maybe I'll come back, you know, <laughs> or, or maybe I'll just, um, here's here's an example of that in my own life that I laugh at a lot is back when I was in college. Um, this was before the internet was everywhere. Uh, it was nineteen. It was 1994. Um, I was in college and I spent a semester in Israel. And on the way to Israel from the U.S., we had a 12 hour layover in Amsterdam, which is where Van Gogh is from. And I knew Van Gogh was from there. But I didn't know anything about museums in Amsterdam, except for one thing. And I knew that there was a wax museum, Madame Tussauds, 
<laughs> in Amsterdam. And so I, the plane landed at seven, our flight took off at seven in the morning, our flight to Tel Aviv took off at seven at night. This was pre 9-11, so you could leave the airport at will. I was like, I've got 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. To, to explore Amsterdam. I'm going to Madame Tussauds because I am certain they're going to have a statue of Van Gogh, <laughs> which they did. And I got a picture of myself with my arm around this <laughs> dumb statue of Van Gogh, not realizing that I'm three blocks away from the Van Gogh Museum. Oh, oh wow. gosh. Right there. Yeah. yeah. And then I got on, the, got on the plane and left, you know, and haven't been back. Uh, and, and I live with that. Now, yeah. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I've got that, I've got that dumb picture. In fact, I might email it to you just to your, your listeners. <laughs> that'd be great. No, that'd be great. That'd be great. Oh, that's, that's, that's just, I, I laugh at it so much. Just thinking, oh gosh. Yeah. That's <laughs> so <laughs> funny. Yeah. So, so we, we live with the limits, right? We live within the limits of, of, of navigating this world. Absolutely. And that's an example from my life. Yeah, you've given me a lot to think about. You've given me some uh, some things that are going to pu- push me a little bit too, like not having a map, not having a plan, and letting and and you know what? The other thing too is, I think often I would be like that. That is really a, I love this. Come look at it. Don't you think it's cool? But now I understand like why he might not think it's as cool as I think it is. You yeah. know, and so yeah. I love that. I'm a big fan of the map, and I'm a big fan of reading the things on the wall. Yeah. Um, but but it's just trying to take in the museum in a day is, is yeah. where I'm like you can't, you can't yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah I, I think too it's it is a one of the reasons I wrote the book is because when I start talking about art with people one of the common experiences is people will will react kind of like oh I don't do art I don't you know I don't get it. Uh-huh. Uh, as though there's some sort of uh, academic hurdle we have to clear before we can really enjoy art. Yeah. And I just want to, I want to help people understand that, that it is a very valid form of art criticism mm-hmm. to look at a painting and say, I like this one. Mm-hmm. Um, or to look at a painting and say, I don't like this one much. You know, yeah. that's, that's valid. It's, it's, yeah. you don't have to know why. Yeah. Um, you can be curious and maybe look into why. Uh, you know, what, what, what's the distance between you and that painting? Um, but you, you can just take it at face value and give yourself the time, mm-hmm. um, the number of your days to become more familiar with how art does its work inside of you, yeah. uh, rather than feel like, well, I have to understand, you know, the history of Holland. Yeah. You don't. So, you know, you can get there if you want to, but you don't, you don't have to, you can just, right. you can just look at the painting and, and uh, take it in. Yeah, that's mm. true. So Russ, you could, you could drop everything today and go to any museum. Where would you go? Mm. You could just drop it. I any- would go to Amsterdam. Yeah, I would go to the, <laughs> the I'd go to, no, I, well, actually I would go to the Academy in Florence okay. um, to see Michelangelo to David. Uh, okay. Uh, that's, that's the work of art that uh, that I feel uh, m- most urgently drawn to. Mm. Um, and I don't have a plan necessarily to get there yet. Yeah. Uh, and I've never mm-hmm. I've never been in person to see Michelangelo's David. Uh, but it's it's, uh, you know, I, I have a ridiculous thing that I say about Michelangelo's David that uh, and I know it's a ridiculous thing, but I say it as often as I can just to get a rise out of people and see if anybody will, will refute the claim. Mm. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you guys now what yeah, that is. And that is I, I, I believe I believe that Michelangelo's David is the single greatest artistic achievement in the history of humanity. Wow. But that's that's the claim. Uh, a couple caveats. Yeah. I, it's it's not my favorite work of art. Uh, it's not it's not even it, it might be in my top 10. Uh, but in terms of the achievement, what was accomplished in Michelangelo's David, I can't come up with anything that beats it. Um, I think about, you know, the, 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 the duration of the 500 plus years that it stood um, and and never has it not been revered as one of the greatest sculptures ever made. Um, you can't, you can't present a painting and say, no, it's this because we're talking about achievement and paintings are two dimensional and this is three dimensional. Mm-hmm. You can't bring me a bronze 
sculpture or a clay sculpture because that's a medium where you can add to, you can make mistakes. Uh, but with marble, you can't. It's, and marble is purely subtraction. You're only taking away. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't add back to it. And so if you make a mistake, it's yeah. made. Yeah. Uh, and then the final thing for me is that he's nude. And, it, you know, so so a lot of times people will be like, what about the Pieta? And I, I will say, well, one, it's Michelangelo. So <laughs> I'm kind of even half right already. Uh, but but two, uh, the they're they're draped in in robes. And what's so and so there's a lot that you can do with that where you don't have to get the human anatomy exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, but with David, because he's nude, if, if there's something off about the musculature of his arm um, or the, 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 uh, the proportion of the, of the, the shoulder blades in his back uh, or the way that his ankle is formed, your eye will immediately go to it. And, and, mm -hmm. and the uncanny Valley will, will open and, and you'll say, well, this is, and it, and it's it's perfect. He's perfect. Uh, yeah. And 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 there's there's no like because we're humans looking at a human, there's no disguising the precision of the 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 figure of of David. And so all of those things together, I'm like I just can't, you know. So yeah. I know it's a ridiculous thing to say. I know that artists, <laughs> are blah, blah, blah. I know all, all of that. Yeah. Um, but I welcome the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, I'm very, I have a similar opinion to you. It's like, yeah, I think it is perfect. And I think it is that, but I think just like you, it's not, in, it's, I don't even know if it's in my top 10. I totally appreciate it. But I yeah. think, and why you were talking, I was thinking, why don't I appreciate it more? You know? And I think maybe because it maybe for me it's too perfect. Like I would lean more to the impressionist, like you know, idea of of painting or sculpture, and maybe a little more extreme and all that. So it's sure. so perfect that I'm like it kind of disconnects with me. Yeah, because it's yeah. so on the nose, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a it's fascinating. Yeah, there's a whole chapter in the book just devoted to that yes. statue. Yeah, um, and. Uh, yeah, his face, yeah. His, his 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 eyes. I, I just don't. I don't understand right. how that. Happens. Well, especially um, thinking you're in, it's a block of marble and you're chiseling into it, and like you say, there's you can't make a mistake. Right. Yeah. You can't crazy. use the hot glue gun. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You can't. <laughs> well, Russ, we really enjoyed your book, and we've really enjoyed this conversation with you. You're a wealth of knowledge, and I just love digging into your brain. You've given me a lot to think about. <laughs> you're you're pressing, you're press pu pushing me out of my boundaries. I think it's time to go to a museum. I want to collect more things into my catalog. Babe. Yeah. Well, and for me, <laughs> yeah. just, with the book, I just want to thank you for writing the book because you talked about how art makes you you want to slow down and think. And that after I finished each chapter of the book, I would slow down and go instead of just trying to finish the book really fast, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to take two or three things you said in this chapter and just think about it for a few days. And the, mm -hmm. it was really meaningful for me to take that time to think instead of just rushing through it. So, yeah. Well, yeah. That, thank you. I, I appreciate, I appreciate all of that. I, you know, just re remember you have the rest of your life mm -hmm. to engage yeah. with art. And so yeah. there's no, there's no hurry. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, what's on the other side is going to be more beautiful anyway. Yeah. And so, um, so, you know, it's not a race. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you taking time with us today, Russ. And Thank you. We, uh, I'm sure Scott is going to just nerd out about this conversation for a while. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. It's, been, it's been a lot of fun. Yes. Have a wonderful day, Russ. All right. You too. Thank take, you. Take, take, take care. Well, I've been saying it for a number of years, babe. What's that? You're worth more dead than you are alive. <laughs> wow. Well, so that's what you got out of this talk with, yes. with Russ Ramsey. That's right. I've seen your office. I know all the art you produce in there. And once you're gone, babe, we'll be banking. I'm afraid to tell you that I don't think you're going to get that much for what's on what? that wall. Brilliant artist. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Not to the scope of the people we talked about today. Well, you just yeah. wait and see, because I will promote you after you're dead. <laughs>
<laughs> some weird thing to say. You're going to be like Van Gogh's brother. It's like, hey, yeah. look what I got here. <laughs> well, I guess I feel good about that. Yeah, I think you're so talented. And yeah. I, I love to watch you kind of geek out over art. It's kind of cool that your brain like works in those ways. Yeah. And I love how we talked about how art is, it's, I think it's innately part of us. Yeah. Like, I think we, a lot of people think, oh, I'm not an art guy and all that, but I think we innately have something in us that appreciates beauty. Yeah. And it's in different forms. Like we talked about at the beginning, it's like, it could be museums, it could be cathedrals, it could be cars, it could be, there's so many things that we can see beauty in. Yeah. Yeah. And I did love that he talked about those, the three things that only humans connect with because- yeah. Uh, it was kind of weird as he was talking about that. I'm looking at our dog that lays on the bed right there while we podcast. And I'm thinking security dog. Yeah. Security. Yeah. He doesn't understand beauty. Like mm -hmm. a human would understand beauty. He doesn't understand the truth. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the things that he was talking about, I was like, that is so incredibly true. And so I love that, you know, he just kind of pushed us to engage with beauty in a way that only humans can do. So I would totally tell everyone to read Russ's book, mm -hmm. Rembrandt is in the wind. Yeah. You can get it. I got it on audiobook mm -hmm. for one credit <laughs> or you can, I would also, I love having the physical book, but I was like, I just, I want to read this one. I want to read it now. So yes. I got it on audiobook. Yeah. And also on his Instagram, Russ has uh art Wednesdays uh -huh. where he picks an artist and then shows their paintings or their sculptures and kind of talks about their life. So yeah. it's, that's pretty fascinating too. You can learn a lot there. Yep. Yep. He's a pretty cool guy. And we hope you enjoyed this interview with Russ Ramsey. Party, party of five and a half over and out. We'll see you next time. I hope. <laughs>